You telling me behind the camera? <laughs> Action. <laughs> Oh my god, hi! Hi! How's it going? <laughs> my name is Kathy. My name is Celeste. And Celeste is going to be telling this story. So buckle in because it's going to be a wild ride. Yeah, it really is. Is it? Yeah, it really is going to be a wild ride today. So today I'm going to be telling you about the bizarre disappearance of Brandon Swanson. Oh. Yeah. So, Brandon Swanson was born on January 30th, 1989, so he was an Aquarius, mm -hmm. and he was born to Brian and Annette Swanson. Mm -hmm. He was raised alongside his little sister in Marshall, Minnesota, and Marshall is like a pretty small town. It, it holds a population of about 13,000 people. Oh. It was an ideal place to raise kids just because of the tight-knit community. It had like a super low crime rate, mm -hmm. and so the parents were like, this is like, you know, this is ideal to raise our kids. Yeah. The town is pretty small. They have two liquor stores in the town. So like, just to give you an idea of how small it is. Wow. And one of the liquor stores is actually featured on the City of Marshall website, which oh. is like, <laughs> I found that kind of funny. I feel like because it's so small, maybe that's why they have it featured on there. Yeah. They're like, look, you can buy alcohol. You can... You know, that's pretty much it. <laughs> <laughs> that's about it. Brandon was the only son, and he was the oldest. He was raised in a really loving home. He was always really, really intelligent, like from a really young age. He could always be found reading a book. He would get lost in books, mm -hmm. and he would just read them back to back. Like, he'd always be reading. By the time that he was a teenager, it was the early 2000s, so computers and video games were coming onto the scene, and they were super popular, you mm -hmm. know? And that was something else that he really enjoyed and was really good at was like technology stuff mm -hmm. and here's a picture of him Aww. he always did really really good in school too like he excelled well wow. he was always really excited to learn new things he was also really family oriented and he took the time to spend quality time with his family he would do anything he could to support them because that was like his family and he was tight with them, you know? Wow, he sounds like a sweetheart. Yeah. People noticed that he had always been really mature for his age. Like he just, like if he said that he was gonna do something, he would do it. He always kept his word. He was really, really dependable. And when he was 15 years old, he got a job at a grocery store and he worked there for four years. Wow. <laughs> Which is wild, because I'm like, the longest I've ever stayed at a job was like, like four to five years. Mm-hmm. So, for a teenager to stay somewhere? Yeah, literally, that's, for that's four impressive. Years. Yeah. Because he was so dependable, everybody really liked him. And it was easy for him to make friends because he just was easy to get along with, you know? Yeah. He graduated from Marshall Senior High School in 2007. And he enrolled in a one-year wind turbines program at Minnesota West Community and Technical College. Because he really cared about the environment. That was something that he was always really interested in. And, like, natural energy, you know? So that was something that he was like, this is right up my alley. I can join this program. And I'll I'll be able to do something that I love you know mm -hmm. the college was in Canby Minnesota mm -hmm. which was about 30 miles away from Marshall so he was still able to live with his parents while going to school there mm -hmm. and that worked out for him because he was you know he was happy to stay with his family he was happy to have somewhere to live while going to school yeah and it was only like a like 35 to 40 minute drive to school Oh, nice. And so it worked for him. Yeah. And everything was going really, really well. And he was excited for his new journey and career path. He obviously did well in college just the way he did in high school. Mm -hmm. And as he progressed, he kind of started looking at other options. You know, he's getting older. He wants to see what other options are out there for him. He actually made plans to transfer to Iowa Western Community College in Iowa, mm. which would be 250 miles away from his hometown Marshall so Whoa. he for the first time in his life he would be on his own away from his family 
well, living alone, you know? Yeah, in a place that he's just like a whole new place to him. Yeah, exactly. Unfortunately, his opportunity to move to Iowa never came. So in May of 2008, Brandon was getting close to the end of the academic year and he was really excited about finishing his first year of college and looking forward to his plans to transfer to Iowa. Mm -hmm. Tuesday, May 13th was the last day of classes at Minnesota West. Mm -hmm. And so a bunch of people were partying. Brandon attended two parties to celebrate the end of the year. And the first party took place in Lind, which was seven miles away from his house in Marshall. So it was literally like a 10 minute drive, maybe 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. This is Lind. Oh, okay. Here's Marshall where he lived. Okay. And Canby is where he goes to school up here. Oh, okay. So according to the attendees, Brandon was one of five to six people at the party. He was pretty lively, like he was in a good mood and everything while he was there. It was more of a kickback than an actual party. He had his ears pierced, so he was wearing his like normal little studs. He was wearing his blue jeans, a polo shirt, a zip up hoodie, and then like a cap, like a baseball cap. Mm -hmm. His friend said that he had at least one drink while he was there, but they also said that he didn't seem like he was drunk at all like mm. he didn't seem like he was wasted or anything like that yeah which makes sense because like you're not gonna get drunk off of one drink but also at a gathering whether it's a kickback or a party i feel like you're not really paying attention to what other people are drinking unless they're like come and take a shot you know that's true that's true so it is possible that he had more to drink but nobody saw yeah between the hours of 10 30 and 11 p.m brandon left the party and he went to another party in camby so mm -hmm. He went from Lind up to Camby. Oh, damn. He went to this party to say goodbye to a classmate who was actually transferring the next day. They were actually going to relocate, so he wanted to just, like, go and, like, say farewell, you know? Yeah. And celebrate with his friend. And he got there, and it was a pretty big party. It's suspected that on his way to the party, he took the back roads and avoided the highway so that he could avoid getting a DUI. Mm -hmm. But that's never been verified. Mm -hmm. The second get together was like a pretty big party. Mm -hmm. There was alcohol flowing, you know, mm -hmm. there was alcohol everywhere. There were a lot more people there. And again, Brandon's friend said that he had one drink. In this case, he had a shot of whiskey mm -hmm. and they didn't see him have any other drinks. But again, like... There's no way to verify that for sure. Yeah. But they said the same thing, that he didn't seem like he was wasted or anything like that. He actually didn't stay at the party for very long at all. He got there at about 11.15 and he left at like just before 12 a.m. Oh, wow. Yeah, which is kind of odd. Yeah, because he drove all the way there. Yeah, which was like a 35 to 40 minute drive. So it wasn't a super long drive, but like he drove all the way there and then he only stayed for like 30 to 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. But it could just be that he was like ready to go home. That happens, yeah, you know. He's just tired. Yeah, so if you look at the route from Camby to Marshall, it's a 34 minute drive. But it's just a straight shot, you know. You yeah. just take the highway and it takes you straight to Marshall. Mm -hmm. Brandon decided to take the back roads and it's unknown how familiar he was with the back roads. Mm. He likely decided to do this to avoid getting a DUI like, mm -hmm. like he did on the way there potentially. It's 2008 and so he doesn't have a smartphone. All he has is a flip phone. Mm -hmm. that doesn't have gps or anything like that he had a couple of drinks that we know of and on top of that he was legally blind in one eye mm -hmm. and so he had to wear glasses all the time and the back roads are super super dark so in other words it's really easy to get lost especially if you're him you know it yeah. would be really really easy to get lost yeah Brandon had a prior DUI arrest, a minor in possession, that could have contributed to his fear of getting a DUI on mm -hmm. the way home. Mm -hmm. So it's possible that he was like, I don't want, I'm scared, you know? Yeah. The gravel roads require multiple turns. The highway is like a straight shot. It's like boom, boom. The gravel roads are more like a staircase. So oh. he would have to go boom, 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 or boom, 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 you know? Yeah. So like, it wasn't like a straight shot the way the highway was yeah there is speculation that brandon may have been warned about dui checkpoints along the highway oh before he left the party but that also has been unverified i was also thinking something when you told me that he has a or he had a prior dui it sounds like he didn't really drink much at these parties maybe he 
was like, I want to be responsible. Obviously, I don't want to drive drunk, so I'm just going to have, like, a drink yeah. here and then a drink there. But it would make sense that he still has that fear of getting a DUI because he's like, well, I, I already got one. What if they sense, like, any alcohol in me? I don't want to, like, get another one, you know? Yeah, and he was 19. Oh, oh so, okay, so yeah. any alcohol in him so would... any alcohol yeah. he would be in trouble for. So okay. that's probably a big part of it as well. Yeah. So the roads that he took went through huge chunks of land. Like, mm-hmm. some of the land was just super flat and vacant. Vacant? Mm-hmm. I always say, it like, one word wrong. It's okay. <laughs> and some of the chunks of land had huge cornfields and then some of the chunks of land had a lot of vegetation and trees and bushes and stuff like that Mm. and he starts driving down this maintenance road between two big cornfields what's a maintenance road that's what i said and so i looked it up and it's like basically these roads that are not maintained the way that gravel roads or highways or like regular roads are Uh and so basically if you drive down them you're driving down it at your own risk kind of thing oh like if you to fix your tractor yeah i think so or something like that like something along the lines of that but basically like don't drive down it because if you if anything happens while you're on that road you're liable for it you like if your car breaks if you like if something falls on your car or anything like that you're liable so it's like drive at your own risk in minnesota specifically i don't know if they have them here wow yeah so he starts driving down this maintenance road i think at that point he realizes like oh crap i probably shouldn't be on this road i'm gonna turn around and get back on the gravel road Mm -hmm. so he starts pulling around and as he's turning around his car like goes into like this ditch thing (gasps) and it's like teetering like that and he and he's like run like pushing on the gas and his wheels are just spinning he can't get out that's so scary yeah he's 120 to 130 pounds and he's 5'5 so he wouldn't be able to like push the car out by himself yeah you know he's like obviously kind of freaking out and he decides that he's gonna call his friends and see if someone can come and help him yeah and so he's starts calling his friends he can't get a hold of anybody oh probably his last resort was calling his parents yeah this is what's kind of odd he ends up calling his parents at 1 54 a.m oh that's like way later huh? i know and he left the party just before 12 so it's like almost two hours basically unaccounted for wow on the highway it would have been 35 to 40 it, on the back roads it would be like 50 minutes maybe to like an hour and 20 minutes max mm. so he but he was trying to get home for almost two hours so it's like what was he doing during that whole time if he was just driving home maybe he spent like a good portion of that trying to get out of the ditch yeah maybe so he calls his parents brian and annette swanson at 1 54 a.m brandon is on the phone with his parents he tells them that he's right off highway 23 near lind Mm -hmm. so that's where he's at and he's like telling his parents this is exactly where i'm at i'm right next to highway 23 come and get me please and they're like okay perfect we know exactly where he's at let's go get him we know exactly where that's at that's like 10 minutes away so they drive there they're like okay we're here where are you at (laughs) and he's like i'm right here and they're like we can't see you anywhere we're literally where you told us to go you're not anywhere nearby oh my god he's adamant he's like i know exactly where i'm at i'm <gasps> confident about where i'm at this is where i'm at i'm not lying about that like this is where i'm at and he starts getting kind of frustrated and they're like okay listen like let's we'll flash our lights and if you see our lights you Tell let us. us know you know yeah. it's dark out there there's not like street lights out in the farmlands you know like they don't yeah. they don't need farm street lights because no Nobody farms at night. They farm in the morning or during the day. So, like, it's super dark. He should be able to see the lights. He can't see the lights. Can't see the lights at all. He's like, I'll flash my lights and you tell me if you see mine. And so he starts flashing his lights. They can't see his either. Oh, my gosh. And at this point, Brandon is becoming, like, more frustrated and a little bit more impatient because I'm sure at this point he's like, I'm tired. I want to go home. It's cold outside. It's, like, 40 to 45 degrees outside. All he's wearing is, is like, a hoodie. He's, like, telling his mom, like, that he's getting upset and he ends up hanging up on her. She calls him back and she's like, I'm sorry. Like, I didn't mean to, like, make you upset. We just want to find you too, you know. Like, we just want to... We all want to go home, basically. They start talking to him again and they're like, are you sure that that's where you're at? Because, Mm -hmm. like, we're looking and you're nowhere here. Like, and we know where we're at, you know. Yeah. And he's like, you know what? I'm just going to walk towards Lind. I can see it. I'll meet you at the Linwood Tavern in the parking lot. So he's like, I'll just walk there and I'll meet you in the parking lot and then we can all go home. Mm -hmm. And so they're like, okay 
that sounds good. Like, just stay on the phone with us so that we can, like, make sure you're safe. Yeah. And he's like, okay. Annette, Brandon's mom, mm-hmm. was starting to feel kind of sick. So Brian, Annette's dad, was like, I'm going to take your mom home. Just stay on the phone with us. And he's like, okay. He's driving Annette home, mm-hmm. Brian is. And while they're on the phone with Brandon, he's talking about how he's having to jump over fences. He's saying, I'm going to go across the field instead of staying on the gravel road because it'll be faster. I know exactly where I'm going. Like, this would just be better. At this point, he had jumped two fences already, and he's telling his dad that he can hear water nearby. Mm -hmm. And his dad is like, water? Like, there shouldn't be any water near where you're at. All of a sudden, at 3.10 a.m., Brandon yells, oh shit, and then the phone call goes silent, but it's the phone is still active. And so the parents are on the phone with him, and they're like, what's going on? Are you still there? Like, they're shouting at the phone. They can hear that the phone is still going, but... He's not answering back. Brian Brandon's dad said that he heard a noise that sounded like maybe Brandon slipped and fell. But they're like calling out and he's not answering. So they're like, okay, let's hang up and we'll call him back. And if it's dark enough, he'll be able to see his phone. Oh yeah, that's good. And so they hang up and they start calling him and he's not picking up. But the oh. phone is ringing. So it's not like off or dead. Oh, good. You know, okay. like it's still ringing. Yeah. So they're calling and calling and they can't reach him this is the last point of contact that they had with their son oh i know that sucks dude i know so they start freaking out obviously because yeah. they're like our son you know yeah <sighs> and it's like the fact that they had to be on the phone with their son when this happened yeah. like i mean it's good that they were but like it's wild just the sequence of events you know like <sighs> Yeah, literally. So they start freaking out and they're like, let's call Brandon's, all of Brandon's friends and see if they can like come help us look for him. Mm -hmm. And so they call a bunch of Brandon's friends and Brandon's friends are like, yeah, we'll come out and we'll like help you guys look. So they start searching the area. They're searching the area all night and they can't find him anywhere. Nothing. They can't even find like his car or like his phone or anything so then at 6 30 a.m after searching all night his parents have become increasingly worried like they're like he's been missing for like three hours now like let's go to the cops yeah they go to the cops and they're like hey like our son's missing can you help us find him please and the cops are like no yeah and one of the cops even tells annette brandon's mom that brandon at his age has a right to go missing i it's That's like, disgusting. The least you could do is your job, you know? Yeah, literally. It's different than, oh, my son said he was going to go out to a party and then he didn't come back, you know? Like, mm-hmm. he's out past curfew or whatever. Because he's 19, he's an adult. Like, he's a child, but legally he's an adult, you know? And I feel like when the parents are telling you, like, hey, th- these are the se- sequence of events that happened, like, something obviously is wrong, they should listen, yeah. you know? They shouldn't just be like, oh, whatever, you can file a missing persons report or whatever, you know? Yeah. Like, so many, mi- I feel like so many missing persons cases would be solved if the police took it more seriously like in the beginning you know yeah and then it didn't have to turn into like this huge search party or anything like that if they just did what they got paid to do yeah it's like so many people are missing still to this day because of police negligence yep that's just the truth it's a fact it's like all you have to do is your job bro literally that's literally all you and it's like in marshall this small town with a really low crime rate what are they doing yeah what are they their thumbs Yeah, it's so annoying. But eventually they convince the cops to help them, which is so annoying. Because it's like, why you shouldn't have to convince them? Yeah, you shouldn't have to convince them to do their jobs. Yeah. They ended up getting the phone records for Brandon's phone, and they found that it was nowhere near where his where he told his parents he was oh yeah and so they start tracking the ping and they find that it was at least 20 miles away from where he said he was oh yeah the cops have an idea of where he was and they go to that area and they find his car (gasps) that afternoon of wednesday may 14th they find his car and this is where they found his car whoa yeah Something that was really strange that they found was that his glasses were in the car. Oh, yeah. that's weird. He was legally blind in one eye and it was pitch black outside. Why was he walking somewhere, like trying to find his way back to town without his glasses? Ooh, yeah. 
That's weird. I know. They found Brandon's car and it was abandoned in the ditch off a gravel road mm -hmm. about a mile north of Highway 68. Unfortunately, there were no tracks that were showing which direction he went or anything like that. Here's something that's really interesting. There was like a cell phone tower and it was near Miniota, which is right here. Oh, okay. The cell phone tower pinged Brandon's phone five miles away from the tower. So it was like right in Miniota, but this is where it's car was found oh and then they never found his phone yeah that's weird that seems like there was some foul play with the glasses him being legally blind and then the phone never being found i know i know so they went to that area because it was like supposedly within five miles of the area within the tower mm -hmm. and so they were like searching in that area profusely they even had aerial teams like in the air looking wow and they couldn't they didn't find anything like they never found anything when brandon was on the phone with his parents remember he was like i see a light i'm just gonna walk towards it like that's lind and i'm gonna oh, like, yeah. meet you there or whatever yeah the cops suspected that maybe the light that he saw was actually in taunton not in lind and so he was like probably trying to walk towards that because there was a red light in taunton that the cops could see at night and so they were like that's probably where he was going and he was just confused about his location they they started searching the area and they had search dogs that were helping with the search and the dogs followed a scent that led to that red light in Taunton. It actually ended up like pointing to an abandoned farm and then towards the Yellow Medicine River which was right there by the road. Oh that must have been the water that he heard. Yeah that's what I was gonna say. It like fits the narrative of him hearing water nearby yeah concerned that brandon might have ended up in the river they brought in boats and they combed the river banks mm. to see if he was anywhere in the water but they couldn't find anything again nothing what that makes no sense yeah after a while of like not finding anything the search went on for a while they ended up just calling off the search because they couldn't find him and even though the major search was called off brandon's family kept their porch light on every single night just in hopes that he would come home to them. Oh. Yeah. In May of 2009, a year after Brandon went missing, Brandon's law was created, which requires authorities in Minnesota, Min yeah, Minnesota to conduct a preliminary investigation with no delay oh. um, regarding a missing persons report, regardless of age. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. That's freaking awesome. Yeah, and the law went into effect on July 1st of 2009. Wow. So after the initial search, they picked things back up again in the fall because that's when like the crops were like dying or whatever. And the search dogs followed Brandon's scent to an area northwest of Porter that they hadn't checked before. But again, they didn't find anything. And then in the spring, after the snow melted, they decided it would be a good idea to start looking again. So they started looking and it was a repeating cycle all through 2011. They covered 122 square miles of ground by that time, but still nothing was ever recovered. Not Brandon's phone, not like an earring or like a piece of clothing or his hat, anything. Like nothing was ever found. That makes no sense. I know. It literally makes no sense. And in 2010, the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension took the lead in the case mm -hmm. and they set up a tip line and they got around 90 leads, which really isn't much. They were really hoping to find something, but all leads were just a dead end. When there's cold cases like this, there are so many theories and there's yeah. so many armchair detectives that like do so much research and try to find out what's going on. Yeah. And with this case, it's not so different. There are so many theories. I'm just going to go over a few, but like if you want to look into it, you should because like there are so many that are plausible. The most popular theory seems to be the drowning theory. People think that Brandon drowned in the river. So the Yellow Medicine River is nearby. It's right next to Brandon's last known location. Mm -hmm. However, the entire theory is really confusing for people because even though in the grand scheme of things, the river is in the same general area, it's not really like a river. Like people that live nearby just say that it's like a creek. Oh, okay. It can get kind of high. It can get up to like 15 feet high in the spring, which is right during the time that Brandon was there. Mm. And sometimes it's just like knee deep. Mm -hmm. At this time, it was flowing pretty quickly through Porter. The river runs a total of 107 miles through Southwest Minnesota and the river is pretty small. The approximate location 
in that the search parties narrowed in on was over a two to three hour walk from where Brandon's car was found. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't make any sense because if he left the party at 12 a.m., like right before 12 and then called his parents at 1.54 and then they lost him on the phone at like 3.10, mm -hmm. like that that would mean that he would have had to walk from 2 a.m. to 3.10 a.m. at a distance that would normally take two to three hours. Oh. You know? So it just doesn't really line up, to me at least. Yeah. Especially if he was not walking along Highway 68, which is like the straight highway, which he yeah. might not have been. He might have been walking like the long way. Yeah. I think that's the most likely since he got lost. He was probably walking like the long way, especially because he said he was like... Jumping fences and yeah, stuff. Yeah, and going yeah. across the land and stuff. Oh, yeah. So Brandon's on the phone with his parents and he's just talking to them when all of a sudden the call abruptly cuts off after he exclaims, oh shit. And as we know, Brandon mentioned that he could hear the running water nearby. Yeah. Some people think that he may have tripped and then fell right into the river, mm -hmm. which could lead to drowning. Some evidence points in another direction. So there were bloodhounds on the scene, like the search dogs, and they were searching through that area. The scent trail led straight to the river and then through the river to the other side. Oh. So if he had fallen in and drowned and just floated away, his scent wouldn't be on the other side yeah, of the river. Yeah, exactly. So they followed his scent to the other side. It also wouldn't make sense that if he fell in the river while he was on his on the phone, mm -hmm. what are the chances that like he's going to throw his phone out onto the land while he's in the river? Yeah, you that know? doesn't make any sense. That doesn't make sense. And also, like, he's a grown man. He probably would have been able to swim out. Was the phone found on, like, the other side of the river where his scent went towards? The phone was never found. Oh, yeah, the phone was never found. Yeah, but the call kept going. And oh. I think if it, because the phone call kept going, wouldn't the parents have heard, like, the sound of water or, yeah. like, a splash or something? They yeah. didn't hear any of that. It just went silent. But the phone was still, the phone call was still going. Mm -hmm. So it's like, what? You know, another thing is like, why would he even go near the river? Yeah. Even though he couldn't see real well, like he, if he heard the water, why would he walk towards the water? Like yeah. that just doesn't make sense to me. The second theory that I want to go over is the hypothermia theory. Mm. This is where things get a little bit more puzzling and potentially line up a little bit more with the whole entire story. Mm -hmm. You know how the scent led to the river and then on the other side. So if Brandon had crawled out of the river and then he tried to find somewhere to just sit down for a second, it's possible that he could have gone into hypothermia mm. it was like 40 degrees that night the water was super cold because it was the spring water coming down from like the mountains or whatever yeah it only takes about 30 to 40 minutes max for hypothermia to kick in when the oh. weather is about 40 degrees wow brandon would have only been able to travel for a short period of time before falling into unconsciousness or like into complete exhaustion wow and so if he especially if he was soaking wet and the yeah. wind was blowing i think the wind was blowing at like seven miles per hour that night so if that was the case where could he have gone in that short period of time that's where this specific theory doesn't really make sense to me because yeah. i feel like if he did suffer from hypothermia and he fell into one of the fields and they had aerial teams it would have been easy to spot him yeah they would have found him yeah so i don't know about that unless he like hid somewhere else and he's never been found i'm just not sure yeah the third and final theory that i want to go over is the foul play theory because mm -hmm. i think that this is probably the most plausible i know a lot of people don't think so but like it just seems the most plausible to me personally so people have been tossing around theories about farmers being involved somehow in the case mm -hmm. and what if brandon was just walking and a farmer saw him and was like oh it's an intruder and shot him mm -hmm. and then he got scared and he buried him because he didn't know what to do there's the question of like whether or not maybe a farmer accidentally ran over him him with farm mach machinery during oh. the day like maybe he had oh. fallen asleep or passed out from being like exhausted or something who knows and then like he got ran over and he died and then they freaked out who knows yeah something that's really shady is the bloodhounds at one point led to one of the farms but the farmer that like owned the property wouldn't let them search there at all Wow. If you have nothing to hide, why wouldn't you let them search? Yeah. <gasps> Ooh. So it's they like, didn't get a warrant? That's what I'm saying. I don't know why they didn't get a warrant. 
whoa it's all really bizarre and it's really puzzling and i think like most of all i just feel sorry for brandon's family and i feel like this is something that happens way too often yeah he should have been found the night that he went missing if the cops had just done their job immediately maybe he would have been found you know yeah so that is the case of brandon swanson wow you did a great job telling it thank you it's a sad one a sad one my heart goes out to him and his family yeah me too but yeah i'm gonna go ahead and put a poster here for you guys like if you want to screenshot it just you know or share it whatever he might be out there somewhere who knows yeah so yeah we'll finish getting ready we'll be right back go ahead and get I'm breakfast sorry. at this point like don't get me Cassie. crazy don't get me crazy we're back you did a great job telling the story thank you his story deserves to be told yeah. and he, like the world deserves to know what type of great human being he was and i hope that they do find him yeah i hope they do too yeah and thank you for being here thank you for listening subscribe to us if you haven't already we love you thank you for being here yeah and we'll see you next time see you next time have a good day <laughs>